Thank you very much, choir, for that song. And it's my prayer that that prayer will be answered in Jesus' name. Look around you. Welcome somebody to church. Give them a handshake and a warm smile. A firm handshake and a warm smile and say, you're welcome to church. It's a pleasure to see you in church. Hallelujah. I want us to sing a song. The first row, the first stanza of uh, Baptist hymnal, I think 482 or so. When the roll is called up yonder. We sing that song most times when we have funerals. But you know we are not singing it to the dead person, right? So it's not a funeral song because the dead do not hear. Rise up, let's sing the song. I wanted to sing it um, a bit prayerfully, not in the normal grig grig kind of stuff, calmly, quietly. And I want to meditate on the words you're singing, just the first stanza and the chorus. Let's go. When the trumpet of the Lord. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the same of God shall gather over from the other shore. When the room is called up yonder. this morning and let your word make sense to us. Even when it doesn't make sense, let your word transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, don't leave that keyboard. Just be there, okay? That song that we just sung speaks of something that we are anticipating. It speaks of a day that is coming ahead of us when there will be a reckoning. Some years ago, I had the privilege of going to school for a postgraduate program. And I remember that I think we're about 21 or 23 of us in that program that started together. And on the day of the matriculation, the registrar called all the names to identify each student. And we're all there. But shortly after the program started, so all of a sudden, the guy sitting in my front, while everywhere was calm and quiet and we all seated, just stood up and began to shout and scream at the president that was addressing us. Was shouting and screaming and screaming and screaming. I was like, I was like what's wrong with this guy? And then he got out of his seat and was walking towards the man. 
then thank God there were protocols that they grabbed him and took him out. He snapped. Do you understand what I mean by he snapped? He lost his senses. They had to take him to the hospital for care. Okay. He regained himself. We graduated together. But of course, there were three who did not graduate with us. They started very well. But on the last day, on the day of convocation, when each name was being called to come and receive your certificates and a handshake from the president, they did not complete their works and their names were not called. But this man who snapped, who we taught, all hope was lost for him, completed his program, got his certificate, got his handshake. As I speak with you, he's in his third year doing his PhD. Beloved, your salvation does not end the day you got born again. That is just the beginning. There is a day coming when the role will be called. And when that role is called, will your name be there? Have you wondered who are those whose name will be on that register? Of course, the Bible tells us there are certain groups of people who shall be excluded from that register. The Bible did not mean words. He said, but outside are the dogs. Have you read that before in your Bible? Huh? Have you read it? Outside are the what? The dogs. Say for fornicators, liars, and he began to reel them out. Shall not have a place in that kingdom. In other words, on that day when that role is called, these persons who have displayed this kind of lifestyle will not find their name appearing on that register. And that is why this morning I will speak in part, briefly, shown evil. Tell your neighbor, shown evil. Say it again, shown evil. One more time, preach to another person, say shown evil. Let's quickly read from 2 Timothy. You have some passages in your bulletin, yes, but I'm reading from something else now. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, and then we'll read Proverbs 3, 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Next. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instrument for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. 22, say do what? Flee the evil desires of, the, of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and do what? Shun evil. This month we have been looking at growing in healthy Christian living. And if we are going to grow in a healthy Christian lifestyle, one thing we cannot 
downplay is the need to shun evil. Why? In Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23, Paul, speaking of Jesus, says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your what? Can you see it? Because of your what? If you don't have a screen, hold your Bible. Because of your evil behavior, but now, again, the emphasis is on the now. But now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through, faith, through death to present you, what? Holy in his sight, without blemish and free from what? Accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved by, I mean, moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under the heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, Christ did not die for you to continue in impurity. He died for you so that on that day, when the role is called up yonder, who are those that will be presented to him? Those who are without blemish, those who are without wrinkle, those who are washed. Again, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be what? Church, can I hear you? To be what? To be what? And in to be holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27 Paul using the analogy of the Jesus and the church to demonstrate the love that should exist between the husband and the wife said this. Let's take it from verse 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and present, to, present her to himself as what? A radiant church, take note again, without what? Stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So you see, I can go on and on with other passages of scripture. You can take down 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, Titus chapter 2 verse 12, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, all but tracing the fact that Jesus died in order to rapture for himself a church that is holy. A church that is without spot. A church that is without wrinkle. How many of you know wrinkles? How many of you had prepared your mind to wear a particular cloth on Sunday morning? And then you said, well, I will iron in the morning. And then at 4 a.m., never happened to you. What do you do with that cloth? Do you wear it? No, some of us will not mention. <laughs> but most of us, you will have to look for something else. Why? It's wrinkled all over. It's not presentable. Or it happened to me one Saturday. You know, I usually will make sure my clothes are ready by Saturday night because I don't want to get taken on our, on our way. I went to my, where I was hanging my suit one, one uh, Saturday night and I pulled out the suit that was in my heart to wear. Guess what? Because of the damp nature of the room, some things have, my, my suit have become guarding. How many of you understand? Become what? Guarding. You don't grow mushroom. <laughs> uh, thank God for my wife. Please clap for my wife for me. <laughs> I screamed. Yay! She just came. And came what? Then my suit. She looked at it and said, don't worry. I'll take care of it. I went to church the next day now. You didn't know. Because she took care of it. Hallelujah. 
That's how God takes care of us. He doesn't want us to be wrinkled. He doesn't want us to be spotted. He doesn't want us to have blames. He doesn't want us to be full of accusations when he presents us to himself. Remember the account of Job. Job said to Satan, have you seen my servant? Each time I read that passage, it reminds me of what the church should be. Have you seen my servant? Let's look at Job chapter, chapter 1, then we'll go on. Verse 1. The Bible described this, I said, in the land of Oz there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That was the way the scripture described him. If you go again to verse 8 of that same chapter 1, the Bible says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Ah, I wish God can say of joy and say, Devil, you don't see my boy called Joy. If God were to mention your name and say, Devil, have you seen my daughter? What will the devil do? Your own life as you are today. Won't the devil laugh? <laughs> Ah, uh, daddy, daddy, don't forget. <laughs> Last night she was in that hotel. Huh? Have you seen my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless, upright, a man who feared God and shuns evil. Not just shunned. The first verse said shunned. The next one says shuns. So he shunned it. He is shunning it. And continues to shun evil. He doesn't have anything to do with evil. This is a man who didn't have the benefit of the Holy Spirit residing in him. You do hear anywhere in that passage where they say the Holy Spirit was in him? He didn't have the benefit of God dwelling inside of him as we do today. Yet, in his days, just like Noah... In a world that was infested by wickedness, the Bible says this man found favor in the sight of God. Why? He shunned evil. He shunned evil. But did that protect him from the devil's activities? No. In fact, your shunning evil is a trigger for trouble. What did I say? Your shunning evil is a what? A trigger for trouble. Not just outside, even in the church. I hope you know that there is evil prevalent in the church. There are people who will soon get there, whose hearts, even though they are in church, are full of evil, as in evil their second name is evil. Even though they wear collar or they wear all those things they tie on their body or they even hold microphone like I'm doing this morning. But in there, evil. But Jesus described them as whitewashed tomb. Outside, they look good, but inside is full of dead men's bones. They are the ones that will carry bad information about people. They are the ones that will spread false, falsehood amongst people. They are the ones that will sow discord. They are the ones that will cause trouble where there is peace. The Lord deliver us from their hands in Jesus' name. And if you are one of those, may the Lord deliver you from such in the name of Jesus. So they shun the evil. But like I said, your shunning evil is a trigger. Because when devil saw that, he said, ah, ha, ha, ha. You think he's just doing that for nothing. It's not because you have protected him. Let me touch his life. But the man, the Bible tells us, in spite of all the devil did to him, he was not shunning evil just because God blessed him. He was shunning evil because he loved the Lord. So the way you relate, react, behave, when it comes to the issue of unrighteousness around you, is a testimony to how much you love God. It's not about those who are watching you. It's about you and your God. But what is evil? 
There are different words translated as evil in many of our passages of the scriptures. The first one is a word that is translated as unclean. To be unclean. If you look at Luke chapter 3, I mean chapter 4 verse 33, you will see the word there. I won't bore you with the Greek pronunciation, but that word is translated evil. You will see it, if you are reading the NIV, you will see it there. The NIV puts it as impure spirit. It is that same word is also translated as evil spirit. So somebody who carries an impure thought could be considered as somebody carrying an evil thought. So if your thought is not pure, there is evil resident there. It's also another word for wickedness. Evil. Wickedness. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, the word translated wickedness in some of our passages, I mean our translations, is also translated evil in some others. It says, therefore, let us keep the festival. Not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness. That word translated wickedness there can also be translated as evil. And these are children of God. Paul telling them there's a possibility of eating your bread with malice and wickedness. Malice and evil in your heart. So wickedness can still be evil. And the church must purge itself of it's pride in prestigious men who are living in shameful sin. You know, there are some people that we know are not living right. We know the things they are doing are not correct. But because of their status, because of their caliber in society, and sometimes even in the church life, we overlook it. A pastor who beats up his wife. A child of God, a husband who will not provide for his family. But because of the person's status, small, small talk to them, making no verse. We must, as a church, stand against such. Because you use the word, you use the word leavened. You know, what, you know what the leaven is? Yeast. A little yeast will make the whole dough rise. When you overlook the error of somebody because of the prestige they hold, others will follow suit. Another word for evil is unrighteousness, injustice, and iniquity. First Corinthians 13, 6, Paul talking about love. Say, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. How do you feel when injustice is meted against somebody you don't like? Eh, not good for them. Eh, not good for them. It's only a reflection of the state of your own heart too. Injustice is injustice. Evil is evil. Whether it is meted on a good person or on a bad person. Malice or maliciousness, depravity, hatred, all of those are considered as evil. Of course, there is evil behavior. So when we say evil, don't just think of that witch in the village. You could actually be one evil person. The Bible says, he that knoweth what is right to do and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. That is evil. When it is in your capacity to be of help to somebody, but because you don't like where the person came from, you hold it back. That is evil. When you have the authority 
and you use that authority to oppress others rather than help elevate them, that is what? Evil. And Paul said these things should not be once mentioned. Evil should not be mentioned. Not talk of acted. Mentioned amongst us. If we are going to enjoy a healthy life, we must shun evil. Manifestations of evil. Evil lust. A desire. Lust. Bible calls it lust. It's also called evil desire. Nobody here will say they don't have desires. We all have desires. Right? No. Um, I was coming in this morning and one of our young men saw me say, Pastor, I like your, your, your cloth. I said, fine, thank you. Uh, I didn't want to ask the next question because I, want, I, won't, I will enter into trouble if I ask the next question. If I say, do you like it? Definitely. He will say, I like it. Do you want it? Definitely, I want it. And they say, ask and it shall be given unto you. But I'm not tired of wearing this cloth yet. It's one of my wife's favorites. Anytime I get her angry and I want to make her happy, I wear it. Don't tell her I said that. Anyway. That's not a bad thing to like what you see or you, you desire good things. But when your desire is after that which is wrong, when your desire is after that which is prohibited, when your desire is after that which is bad, that is lost. When your desire leads to hurt, that is lost. That is an evil desire. When your desire is after something forbidden, let me give us one that will crack us up for now. How many of us know that in NCBC we don't wear trousers to church? Raise up your hand if you know. So if you have a desire to wear trousers to church, whereas you know here it is not allowed, that is an evil desire, is a lust. I didn't say don't wear it anywhere else. But we say here when we are worshipping, don't bring it in. So if I see you on the street, I won't mind, I won't talk, I won't be angry with you. We will greet normal. Because that's what you want to. But by the time you now push that, your desire, and push it into a place where you know it will create trouble, you're already doing something wrong. And that's an evil desire. It's a lost. So, evil manifests in desires after forbidding and harmful practices. Look at what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. He said, flee the evil desire of youth. Some translation will use the word flee youthful lust. Today, what are the things that young people desire? Money. Is it not? We, we, there's nothing wrong with money, but the Bible says the love of money, the inordinate affection and pursuit of money is the root of all evil. And you can see it all around us. Why is the nation as bad as it is? The, the, the love of money. Evil desires. Why do we see young men suddenly just, you see a young man just drive, just suddenly park, park his car. Dr. Now Professor, we have a professor in our station now. Reverend, Do, Reverend Dr. Bagudu became a professor last week. So he's now Reverend Professor Bagudu. Now, he was telling me when I went to see him some time ago, he was just driving out of the church at Fleming. All of a sudden, two young men just parked one of these latest Lexus cars, came out and began to strip himself. Right in the middle of the street. What's happening? Many, you see many, many now. The rate at which young people are becoming mad. Because of what? Money. And many of you here, I hope not, are already getting involved. Your passion is how to make money. And you can do anything to make money. That's an evil desire. And it starts with a desire. A desire for something that can harm you. A desire for something that can hurt you. If you don't shun it, you will get caught. Manifest in desire, there's what we call an evil eye. The evil eye is another word for envy. There is nothing wrong in liking what you see, so, see happen to somebody. But when you now see something good happen to somebody and you get angry, and only 
Kwe Lumi, now only you. Eh? Only you get admission. Now only you carry camera. Tomorrow only you carry video camera. Now only you leave the church. And you're angry. And the next time you hear that, oh, he just got, uh, he won, it, he won a, a competition internationally. Ah, I said it, that boy. Ah. And then in your heart, you begin to look for ways to hurt him and make him feel bad. And when, or when something bad happens to the person, that's what now gives you joy. You have an evil eye. May the Lord cure you of that eye in Jesus' name. If you are somebody who cannot rejoice with people when something good happens to them, check your heart. There is evil resident in you. And we said last week that such a person is going to be under the control of sin because sin does not desire to share bedroom. It desires to rule over you. And you know you don't see envy. It's only, the man, it's only when it has been acted, it starts in the heart. Oh, congratulations, but inside your heart you are bitter. Hey, ah, I heard that you just got promoted. Hey, yeah, God bless you. The Lord will prosper you. And in your eyes, say, Kai, if only I get gone, I'll shoot you now. And then God forbid, see the person that has a miscarriage. Say, hey, ah, thank God. At least she has one reason to cry. Ah! These are not unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians. Christians. In church. Touch your heart and say, Lord, purify my heart. Even when something good happens to someone you consider an enemy, rejoice over it. Evil eye, evil mindedness. This is a person that there is nothing good that they can think about. They are lying down on the bed. They are, they are thinking of terrible things. And so when they speak, the things that come out of their mouth, you will be shocked. But God says, if you are going to live a healthy life, shun these things. And again, we have been told we have the power to do it because the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. And the God has called us to live that life. So what does it mean then to shun it? Sister Christy gave us a very good demonstration last time, if you remember. When I asked her to shun me. You remember? You know if you remember? I asked her to shun me. She did it very well. In fact, the cameraman I gave you tons of, they took the picture of that thing and I sent it to her the other day. And she was like, Ah, oh, I remember. That's what you do to evil and those who perpetrate evil. Imagine that you are seated in your office or in your house and one sister just come. Hey, Sister Juliet, how are you? How far? Hmm. You hear what the Pastor Joy do? What is about to happen? What's about to happen? Uh, uh, let me, what's about to happen? Aploko? Telephone without wire. Not wireless, so telephone without wire. Radio without connection. You, you hear what the Brother Toba do? I say, hey, hey, tell me, tell me. Not only those who do that, but even those who enjoy it, who encourage them, all of them are roped up in this problem. So to shun it, what do you do? If you don't have anything good to say, keep your mouth shut. I was talking with a friend some years ago and he was telling me something, telling me something, I was just listening to him. Good enough, you know, when God wants to catch the devil, he provides opportunity. The person he was talking about was passing. I just said, I just called the lady, come, 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 come. And she came. Oh yeah. The thing you were telling me now, repeat it. This was there when I was lecturing in the school of nursing. He said, uh, uh, you suddenly lost your tongue. The thing you just tell me now. See, and the, the interesting part is that he said, I will say it to her face. <laughs> and God now answered the prayer. She came. He said, now, I said, please, that thing you just said now, do what? Say it. And I just don't ever come to me again. Many of us have inspired all kinds of 
terrible things because we gave our ears or we gave our attention to them. Shun it. Let people know where you stand when certain discussions are coming up. One of my daughters was going to call me one day and said, Papa, what I know I want to tell you now, I know you will not agree. I said, hey, thank God. Don't just mention it. Because you already know I will not agree. He said, let me, I said, don't bother now because you are wasting your data, you are wasting my time. You already know I will not agree. Put it aside. If you choose to do it, do it. Don't do it with seeking my approval because you will never get it. Let people know where you stand. As a lecturer, as a teacher, as a nurse, as a business person, let people know where you stand. I remember Sister Barakwe, I'll mention her name. During the time when flour became very expensive, you know she had a bakery. She came to me one day and said, Pastor, please be careful where you buy bread. I said, why? He said, today, the kinds of things they are mixing with flour just to make profit is terrible. Be careful where you buy bread. So I asked, how, do, how are you coping? He said, well, uh, we are managing, but I told them I can't do that. You know, everything has an association in Nigeria. Everything has an association. Even association of jobless people. Association of unmarried men. Everything has an association and they detect what should happen in those associations. And many times, the leaders of those associations are not believers. But there are believers amongst them. How many of you heard of a news item on Arise, I think, that was talking about Nigeria signing a document in the EU. I don't know if they've signed it to. They didn't, eh? Praise God. A document that two presidents have refused to sign. They are bringing it up again to legalize certain things, including LGBTQ. We know there are people who practice that here. But to legalize it is another thing. You see, if we don't speak up when we have the opportunity to speak up, you are contributing to the evil. Evil thrives when those who are righteous refuse to speak up or act. Oh, it's none of my business. Don't worry. It will soon catch up with you. Now, me go come talk and me that doesn't my mouth. Now, if I come out, no problem. When the repercussion comes, you too will go down for it. As God's people, we have a responsibility to ensure that when that role is called, I am there. Did you notice? They didn't say they will call family by family. So even though Brother Kwelumi and Sister Toba danced forward, if you like, say I didn't get it correct, I am correct. I can interchange their name. Uh, even though they both danced forward as husband and wife this morning, on that day when the role will be called, everybody to himself. So if your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter is engaging in evil, and because, oh, I don't want to be put to shame. Oh, I don't want to be disgraced. I don't want to soil my reputation. You refuse to address it the way you should address it so that it can be dealt with. You have contributed to it. And the same repercussion comes to you. Children of God, I'll stop here today. But ask yourself, how have you related with the evil around you? In your home, in your workplace, in your business, in your community, in your extended family. Do people know you as a Christian? Or when it comes to that family thing, you submit. Whatever they say is right because that is a culture. In some of us, our cultures are bigger than God. Uh, we be robo people also, and so will they do them. Even when you know this contradicts God's word. Then you sit down there and you pretend, oh, I'm not participating, no. But you are there. You didn't say no to it. You didn't object to it. You didn't let them know the impact of it. Oh, our parents have been doing it, so who am I? I'm too young. It takes one man to start a change. 
Pray for yourself this morning. Ask for the grace to shun evil. It starts with the little, little decisions and desires of your heart. Check, always check the desire of your heart against God's word. This thing I am desiring, this thing I am yearning for, this thing I am struggling to get, does it bring glory to God? This thing I am so eager to do, does it, have, does it bring glory to God? Or oh, I'm doing it because so that somebody will notice me, or I'm doing it so that somebody will say, oh, he, he into the tribe. But you know it's going to harm you. It's not going to cause trouble for you. You know it's going to destroy your house. It's going to destroy your home. It's going to destroy your business somewhere later. But for now, I don't care. The Bible says, shun evil. As a man, as a woman, as a young man, as a young woman, married or single, the Bible says, shun evil. You have a choice. God wants you to keep your garment spotless. White. Untainted, unwrinkled, without blemish, without spot. The things that stain us are sometimes not the things we did by ourselves. They are things others do. You could be walking on the street and somebody drives past and splashes something on you. But if you have been watchful before the person did that to you, you would have been able to avert it. Many times we allow people to bring the stain, to bring the spots, because we don't want to hurt them. We don't want to be in their bad books. We don't want them to see me. I don't want them to see me as a fanatic. I don't want them to see me as, a, as, as, as somebody who is becoming a fundamentalist, so to speak. But you must stand for something. The desires of your heart. Can you x-ray them this morning? Do I have an evil heart? Do I have an evil eye? Are there evil desires still warring against me? The Bible says when a man is tempted, he's tempted by the evil desires that he carries in his heart, not by God. Every time you see a woman, you have an erection, you want to go down with her. It's, there is a desire inside of you that you need to submit to the Holy Spirit to deal with. Don't say, oh, it's, it's my nature. After all, I'm a human, I'm a man. No. That is animal instinct. But you're not an animal. It's only animals that sleep with one another. Even some animals still maintain boundaries. Evil desires. Mammon, Babylon, Jezebel. It's not for the world, it's for the church. To stand against it. If the church does not stand against it. The world is already swimming in it. They are only trying to bring it into the church. Fashion sense. Now we have half naked women in church. Every fashion line that comes from the world. The church adopts. You don't have time to question it. You don't have time to interrogate it. Does this bring glory to God? Every business line that comes, the church jumps at it. You don't have time to begin to evaluate it. Does this bring glory to God? It's not everything you can associate with. The Bible says, come out from amongst them and be separate. But many of us, we only came out partially. Half of us is still in it. So we, 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 we undulate, oscillate between two worlds. Between two worlds, you don't have a problem blending with the unbelievers and doing it their own way. And when you come to church, you blend, you do it their own way. A day is going to come, you will not know who you are anymore. I am dying, oh Lord. Draw me nearer. Bible says, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully in his wonderful face. And the things of earth 
we grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As a young lady, you allow yourself to be molested because he's your boss. Oh, what choice do I have? As a young man, you allow your female boss to sexually harass you because she's your boss. She will fire you. You're asking yourself, what choice do I have? It only shows you don't know who you are. Today, you want to make a commitment. Lord, I commit to shunning evil. Some of us are praying for wisdom. Job said in Job chapter 28, verse 28. In fact, from verse 1, he said, Go and search everywhere. Nobody seems to know where wisdom is. But he says in verse 28 of Job chapter 28. He says, The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. And help me, Lord. Help me not to be one of those who enjoy evil. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not. Some are really saying. Who does not have anything to do with the wicked. He won't sit with them. He won't stand with them. He won't walk in their ways. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. But today. It's different. Can you ask the Lord today? Like the song the choir sang. Create in me a clean heart. And purify me so that I may worship you. That's why Jesus came. To raise for himself a generation of people that will worship him without spot. And to rapture a church that is without blemish. But if those who profess to be saved continue to swim in unrighteousness and in wickedness and in evil. Where then will that righteous church that is going to rapture be? If everyone was to be like me, if everyone was to be like you, will Jesus have a righteous church? A wrinkle-free church? A spotless church? A church without blemish to rapture? If every believer were to be like you this morning, will Jesus actually have a church? That he will look out and say, that is my people. If you were the only believer left on earth, will God be able to say, I still have one man on earth? Make that commitment this morning. Today onwards, Lord, I will intentionally shun by the, as you help me, with the help of your Holy Spirit that is at work in me, who guides and leads me, I will dissociate myself. I will stand in contradistinction to that which is evil, wherever it is coming from, whoever is bringing it. I will not be associated with it. I will not be caught up with it. If you are making that commitment this morning, please, you can rise with me as we pray together. But the question comes to me as I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? Touch me one more time. Oh Lord. Father, touch me. Touch me one more time, oh Lord. I need a touch. I need a touch from the Master. I need a touch from the Lord. Touch me one more time, oh. Can you just say that as a prayer for those of us who are standing? Lord, I commit afresh to you this morning. 
to live my life intentionally under the help and instrumentality of your Holy Spirit to shun evil. In whatever way it's manifesting, whether within me or around me, I receive grace to snuff it out. Lord, you will find me ready when you come. And you will not be ashamed to call me your own. In my office, in my workplace, in my home, in my business, in my school, I commit to an upright life. A life patterned after the way of Christ. A life that testifies to the work of your salvation in my life. A life that will leave nobody in doubt of who I am in you and who you are in me. Wherever I go, Lord, I receive grace to shine as one of your own, bringing light to every dark spot around my corner. Pour yourself afresh on me, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. You can take your seat. Maybe you are here and there is this particular behavior, this habit. You know it's wrong. But somehow it looks as if you are you are powerless when it comes to it. When it comes, you can't just stop. You can't just resist it. And sometimes you find yourself craving for it. But today you are saying, Lord, I'm tired. If you're there, just rise on your feet. Let the Lord deal with that root of evil and set you completely free from it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless you this morning. We are going out again into the world and you are going to be telling the devil about us. Have you seen my servant as Christians? Yes, nothing disappoints you because of the creation who is waiting for the endless expectation, in endless expectation of the manifestation of your children. Let young men and young women, old men and old women from this congregation begin to manifest your sonship to the world in the name of Jesus.